Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Hashtag Clocked In with me, your host, Jordan Edwards. I'm thrilled to have you tune in as we dive into the dynamic world of productivity, success, and stories of incredible individuals who've mastered the art of getting things done. Whether you're commuting, hitting the gym, or just relaxing at home, this podcast is the go-to source for inspiration and actionable tips to level up your productivity game. I'm on a mission to unravel the secrets of those who seem to effortlessly manage their time and achieve their goals. So if you're ready to clock in and unlock your full potential, you're in the right place. We've got a lineup of amazing guests, industry experts, and thought leaders who will share their insights and strategies to help us crush your to-do list and make the most out of every moment. Get ready to get inspired, motivated, and equipped with the tools you need to supercharge your productivity. This is Hashtag Clocked In with Jordan Edwards. Let's dive in. Hey, what's going on, guys? I got a special guest here today. We have Daniel Marcos. He is the co-founder and CEO of Growth Institute, and in less than a decade, they've been recognized as one of the top 5,000 fastest growing companies in the USA. On top of that, they have over 40,000 members across 70 plus countries. Daniel, that's incredible. How are you doing today? Good. Having a lot of fun. Thanks for the invitation. (laughs) Yeah, I'm excited to have you here on the Clocked In podcast. So, Daniel, where does your journey begin? Like, where where did you grow up? Where did you have this? Because it's not, it's hard enough doing business in one country, let alone having clients all around the world. So I started living in, uh, I grew up in Mexico. Uh, I was born in Monterey, raised in Mexico City. And i been an entrepreneur since I remember. I indeed, I think when I was like 10, I broke my parents' garage in half. And I <laughs> half of it, I made an aquarium and I was selling fish uh, in my house. Uh, no way. But I, I, I was very undisciplined entrepreneur. I had three or four businesses. They all did really poor. Um, until I... Went to college. While I was in college, I was I was working for a brokerage house. I was a stock trader in the stock market in Mexico. Uh, and then I lived in Hong Kong for two years, working for the Mexican consulate. So remember, Hong Kong was part of England and went to China in 1997. I was yeah. there the year before and the year after. Um, and it was amazing, the learning and see the process. It's the biggest wealth transfer ever in history without a bullet being shot. Uh, it is really a a story that, that it's important to understand what happened. So I was there in Hong Kong and I worked five years for other companies and really understand the discipline of really leading a company or working in a company, but most importantly, the importance of building an amazing team. If you have a great team, you're going to be able to build a great company. Indeed, I've seen a lot of CEOs that said, oh, I'm, I build a great company. And I was like, not you don't. You build an amazing team. Your team build a company. Uh, you 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 have to be a leader that brings a team, and they do most of the work. Your job is to put them together. Absolutely. So let, let's let's not rush through it too fast. This whole working in Mexico, then going to Hong Kong. What what happened there? So I've always knew that I wanted to have a more international perspective. Uh, my parents, um, my father worked a lot. I rarely see him on the week. He when I was. When I uh, I was uh, awake in the morning, he already left. And when I went to sleep, he haven't even arrived. He worked a lot. Oh, wow. Um, wow. And, but they had a rule. Whenever I was on vacation from school, we were out. I remember my parents picked me up at school at 2 p.m. Uh, and they already had the bags, go to the airport and travel. So I oh, traveled wow. a lot of countries with my parents uh, when I was a kid. And we ate a lot of international food and, and all of that because they wanted uh, that my brother and I had a very international perspective or school. And indeed, there was a rule in my house. You have to study uh, college in Mexico, so you understand the ways of Mexico and all that. But you have to do a master's degree, uh, PhD, whatever, outside of Mexico. Uh, oh, wow. That was, part of the, that was part of the experience. So when I was, after I finished high school, um, I was really not ready for college. I, I did very poorly in high school and very poorly in college. And my father said, hey, you're not really ready. Why don't you travel a little bit and do something. And I was like, what should I do? I said, I could get you a job in Hong- in London. Do you want to go to London? And I was like, yeah. So between high school and college, I worked in London in- at Lloyd's for a year. And then after college, I went to Hong- two years to Hong Kong. Um, so that-, that was part of my parents' life by design, let's say, uh, to prepare us for the world. 
that's incredible to for you to have that experience because I was seeing today that it turns out that in the United States, only 7% of Americans actually use their passport to go outside. It's crazy. I, I've met people, I live in Texas. It's a big state and has a lot of opportunities. I've met people in Texas that have never been out of the state. I'm like, what do you mean you've never left Texas? No, like, I've never need to. And I was like, it's not about needing to. It's about wanting to see the world. It's like, it's a huge world. Why you just stay here? Um, and, and in my case, uh, a lot of the adventure of my life, the great stories that I have with my parents was traveling. Um, so so we, we encourage that. Uh, as an example for my kids, one of the most important things for my kids, uh, my wife and I work on this very diligently. They have three passports. My kids have Mexican passport, American passport, and, and passport from Spain that gave them access to all Europe. So they could really work and travel wherever they want in the world. Oh, wow. And, and what do you think about the benefits of having multiple passports? Because I started looking into this because people were talking and they were like, you don't realize the value on it. You don't realize the value. Uh, so uh, being in Mexico, uh, we always call that Mexico is the country about tomorrow. You have everything to be an amazing world leader, economy wise and all that. And we've been there and tomorrow and tomorrow because we've always had really bad politicians and really bad social stuff. So we're there. We have amazing uh, potential, but we haven't realized it the way we have been realized. But as an example, today we have a president that is trying, it's a very communist, if you want to call it, or socialist. Uh, and it's all about the the, the poor and, and all that. Uh, it, and it's good. It's, I'm very happy he's looking into another part of Mexico that hasn't been uh, supported. But he's saying, because it's very difficult to make everyone rich or make everyone make money, I'm going to make the rich poor. So we're all poor. Like that, that's the wrong mentality. Um, so I was reading this article. I don't know if you read the book, uh, The Next Hundred Years. Uh, it was published around 10 years ago. And this okay. geopolitical guy was giving his perspective of the world. And he said, if there's two countries I would love to invest in the next hundred years, is Mexico and Turkey. And he really? dedicates a chapter to each of the countries. And the last sentence of the Mexican chapter, he said, and I love Mexico, they could have the best uh, growth, whatever, except if they commit a political suicide. <laughs> so it's a possibility, right? Uh, the U.S. today is having some political issues that I don't think is going to be a big thing. I think the U.S. is going to come out of this much, much stronger than the rest of the world. But having my kids, giving them three passports, I think it's important. I think it gives them a different space. And if one country is not going the way they want, that's fine. They could move whenever they want. So, so how do you even go about getting multiple passports? Because I've looked into this and it's there's different approaches. So, so first, they're Mexican because my wife and I were born of course. I've been living in the U.S. 20 years. So they were born in the U.S. So I've been working and living in the U.S. So they were born here. So that, that's how they have to. And then my wife, as an example, she had a Spanish citizenship or uh, family. So we went to the embassy and did all the paperwork and all the process. And she got the passport. And then she gave the citizenship to my kids. Uh, I'm uh -huh. the only one in the family that do not have a Spanish passport. Um it's great that they have those three. So they could really, if they want to study in Europe, they could go to Europe if they want to live there. Uh, if they want to retire, or live in a beach in Mexico, they could do that. Um, so yeah. I think that's a lot of flexibility. The world that's is an amazing world. Why not using it all? Or absolutely. It all? Absolutely. And how did you implement, like, so you go to Hong Kong? Because yeah. the thing I'm kind of pondering is, there's probably a lot of people listening right now who are like, oh, my God, Daniel's got to figure it out. We love travel. But how do you make travel part of your business? And that's always been a juggling factor. It's difficult. So today I have a, a virtual business where we all work remote. Uh, we sell in 70 countries around the world, so I could really live wherever I want. Uh, indeed, uh, three years, uh, we moved to Canada uh, for three years, wanted to look into Toronto and all of, of that and give my kids a little bit of a not a very aggressive perspective or international, but just get him out a little bit. And my wife and I discussed I want to go to Canada for some years. And I went to my team and said, guys, in three months, I'm moving to Canada. And my team were like, what? And I'm like, yeah, don't worry. Nothing's going to happen. Like, you will not even feel it. And that was it. It was it was just like that. So so we value uh, be able to move around 
uh, freely. Uh, in today's world, with all the political and geopolitical structure, be able to move around, I think it's important. Uh, 100. Have that flexibility. 100%. And how long have you been doing the remote like kind of business and remote lifestyle? Well, we, we've been fully remote for around four years. Uh, uh, in COVID, we closed both offices, but I really haven't gone to my office uh, in probably three years before. Indeed, this is very important. Both my offices, I did not have a desk in my office. Um, indeed, the, the Mexican office, we had used to have an office in Mexico City with around 20 or so people. And it was in a WeWork office. I did not yeah. have a WeWork membership. And people were like, but you're the owner. You should have a membership. And I was like, no. I want to come in and get a visitor pass because I want you to see me as a visitor. I'm not here to operate. Your job is to operate the business. My job is to lead the business. So I'm not going to have a membership. I want you to know that I get a visitor pass. And I got into my office with a visitor pass. And they were like, but you should get one. No, I've never had a membership for me. Even the, in the U.S. office, I never had a desk. Because when wow. I go to the office, I go to a meeting room and work with my team. And then I leave and I do all my thinking, work and all that in my home office. I have two home offices. I have this home office that, that it's kind of my desk. And then you go through that door, you go through my kitchen. And then I did a studio and I have a professional recording studio where I do a lot of videos and class and stuff. Um, and I work between here and there. That's so, I think that's so important what you just said right there, because there's so many people that are chasing that next title or that next name. And it's just, it's just not that important. And it needs to be from the top down going, no, you got like, we're the team together. It's not like I'm taking you or I'm telling you what we're working as a team. And I I'm, think that's I'm, really I'm the CEO of my company growth Institute one day a week on Monday. I have all my meetings, strategy, leadership, everything on Monday sales, marketing, everything. And then Monday night, I'm a coach. I'm a CEO. I, I travel. I, I give presentations, conferences, record content. I teach in my company, but as a faculty, not as a CEO. I have all my meetings of CEO on Mondays. And so my company works pretty well. That sounds incredible. because We've been the Inc. 5000 four years in a row without yeah. having an office and just being CEO one day a week. So people would be very amazed at that idea of like, how do you work one day a week? What are you doing? So let's back it up. So you got, so you're in Hong Kong. How, how do we get to that point? Let's, let's catch this up in the story. So when I was going through college, um, I started designing my new business and my father was really worried that I was going to have a new business and I was going to distract even more from college. So you have to understand my father has a PhD in economics. Oh, wow. They, so for him, having a, a son without a degree was like was was painful for him. So the rule in the house is, I don't care what you do, get me a degree. That that was kind of the rule. And I got an yeah. industrial engineering degree in the tough toughest uh, engineering school in Mexico. And um, I was designing my new business, and my father got worried and called my brother and said, "Hey, your little brother is going to get distracted again. Why don't you get him a job for him at least to?" be entertained and have a desk so he will be less distracted. <laughs> so my brother worked in the financial markets and helped me get a job in a brokerage house. And I was trading stock and, and doing options and all that. And I really learned a lot about the stock market in Mexico and the US. Um, so after three years working there, graduate, I got a job in Hong Kong, working for the Mexican consulate in Hong Kong. I was a financial attache for two years. Um, and I was trading stock there because I used to trade stock. So when yeah. I moved there, I opened a, a, an account in E-Trade and I was trading stock in the US all the time. <laughs> and I said, okay, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to go back to my country to be an entrepreneur. What am I an expert at? And I said, stock trading online. And there was no stock trading online in Mexico. I was the first one to put stock quotes and do stock trading online in Mexico in 1998. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we built the first FinTech in Mexico, 1998. Uh, and then we start growing it. And then we merge with Argentina. And I was really acquired by an Argentinian company, uh, very similar to us. They had already raised $8 million. I was very small. And he came to me and said, hey, I'm going to raise $50 million, uh, but I need to have Mexico and Brazil. So you're the best in Mexico. Join with me and we'll go together. Or I'm going to open Mexico and I'm going to raise $50 million and I'm going to destroy you. And I was okay. How much? 
And that day we agree with a number, sign the documents. And he did the same in Brazil. He oh, acquired wow. the biggest one in Brazil, uh, Trader. We went to JP Morgan, New York, raised $53 million. Wow. And scaled the company. At that moment, the three companies together were less than 100 employees. And we raised $53 million from JP Morgan, Goldman, uh, Intel, Microsoft, the best investors you could ever have. And grew it to 1,200 employees, operation nine countries, and sold it to Banco Santander. We were the biggest trading operation at that moment in most countries. Wow. How long was that How long was that process? 1998 to 2002. It took us four years. Oh, my goodness. It was, you know what? We were very lucky we did not understand business because we had no limitations. We thought it was normal. Uh, and we did things that if you ask me today, I would have never do them today because I would start, it's impossible, whatever. But because we had no idea, we just did them. Like raising yeah. money, just to give you an idea. 1998, there was not even one venture capital fund in Mexico. It didn't <laughs> exist. Venture capital was not existent in Mexico, 1998. Today, yeah. there's probably 50 funds. But back then, if you want to raise money, you raise friends and family, or you have to go to New York and raise money in New York. And whenever you go to New York, for it to be worth it, you have to put $50 million. So, so we had to say we're going to be the biggest in Latin America and we're going to open 10 countries and blah, blah. They gave us the money and we execute that. Oh, wow. Because you didn't know how much to even raise. So you just were like, let's do it. So in, indeed, there was something interesting with JP Morgan. We went to JP Morgan and said, they want to raise 10, 20. And JP Morgan said, hey, we don't want to give you 10 or 20. If, you, if we're going to put money in you guys, you have to dominate the market really, really fast. So I prefer to give you 50 so you could really dominate the market. And we're like, okay, give us 50. And we end up raising 53. That's incredible. That is Because it's a funny story, but how did you even have the wherewithal to know that the online marketplace was an area to be in? Because this is 98 where... Most people have no idea what's going on. Like you're probably one of the few people who are in touch with the, yeah. So here, here's something interesting that, that you guys, you live in the U.S. and you don't see this, but whatever works in the U.S. usually works two or three years before any other country. So oh, really? if you see what's happening in the U.S., you could copy a lot of what's happening in the U.S. and build it in your country much faster with less mistakes because you could study what work would in work in the U.S. So indeed, there's there's a fund in Europe. Uh, we have seen this in Europe and Latin America. They're all the time looking into what's working in the US. And then they build that really, really fast in Europe or Latin America. And then when the biggest player in the US wants to grow internationally, they have to acquire you. Um, so it's a strategy we follow significantly in Latin America. Um, if, if you see E-Trade growing in the US, and it did happen with eBay, for example. Mercado Libre is, is the biggest uh, e-commerce today in Latin America. And they did that. They went to E-Trade and said, E-Trade, sorry, uh, to uh, eBay, eBay, and said, eBay, you don't have access to Latin America. We have already operations in 10, 12 countries in Latin America. And eBay bought 10% of them just to have the right of first refusal to buy them later. And at the end, they didn't buy them because they grew really, really big. And today, they're a huge company. They're worth $100 billion or so. Um, and they're the biggest e-commerce in Latin America. Like they're bigger than Amazon in Latin America today. Wow. And they saw what happened with eBay, just copy the model. Just caught that's interesting. That is really interesting. I and this is one of my favorite things about the podcast is I get that perspective where it's like, I never would have known that. There, there was a fund that I saw in, in in Germany. That was their game. Copy the two or three innovations that you see in the US every year and replicate them as fast as you can in Europe. And then you're going to be acquired or you become the biggest one in Europe. Which are, they're both good options. Yeah. They're... But but you could see what worked, what didn't work, mistakes, like everything. And then when you go to an investor, you said, hey, I'm going to be the eBay in Latin America. Or I'm going to be the eBay in Europe. And this yeah. is what they did well. This is what we, they did wrong. This is how much money I need. Done. Wow. So even, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, it's probably like, where Uber is all over the world, there's probably semi Ubers that were purchased that went under the Uber umbrella. Because I was in a lot of Uber companies in Latin America, a lot of them. yeah. 
and they just get purchased or they do their own thing and compete. If, if you're the biggest one in Ecuador, let's say, or in Colombia, for you, it's a company doing 10, 20 million. It's a big company. For Uber, it's nothing. It's like a, like a snack. So for them, That's instead true. of coming to the market and fight against you, they buy the team that they know how to operate. They buy the clients and their cost of capital is so low that they pay you $50 million and it's nothing for them. Yeah. That's incredible. It's a very easy way to do a scale up very, very fast and, and exit fast. So we wow. exit, we raise the money in December 1999. And by 2000, we were out with oh. a decent cash. Perfect timing. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. No, here's interesting. We signed the deal to sell it two days before the peak of the NASDAQ. No way. That, that, that's by luck. It's like we didn't plan it. We didn't time it. It was, it was pure luck. Yeah. Wow. Did, was there a feeling on that a little bit? It, was there a what, sorry? Like a feeling like as the market, because people were just over investing oh, in these. It, it was it was great. No, indeed, it was interesting. So we got Santander to call us. Um, so there was one of our investors. They had probably, at that moment, they have probably 88% of the company, 7%. And BBVA is the biggest competitor of Santander. So Spain has two of the biggest banks in the world. They operate everywhere in Latin America. And they're very big banks. And they love to compete against each other. So if one does one thing, the other wants to do it bigger and better. So VVVA uh, launched a platform with a bank in England that they said they were going to make the best trading platform uh, online all over the world. And Santander looked back and said, I need to do something better. And we were the biggest platform in most countries at that moment in the world. So they came to us and they said, I don't care the price. I'm going to buy you tomorrow. And we said, we have 40 million in the bank. We're not for sale. And Santander said, I don't care. Give me a number. We went to all investors. What's the number that you will sell? And everyone gave us a number. The highest one, we came to Santander and said, that's a price. And Santander wired the money. Because wow. they need to do something bigger than BBVA. Wow. Oh, so you had the competition and it was... But we were the biggest the... one. If, yeah. if you want to do something faster than them, we were the only platform that had the infrastructure to do something faster than BBVA. Wow. That's incredible. We were very lucky. And I was very young, so that put me in, in a very high seat in the entrepreneurial world very, very young. So How old by the time I left, even after working two years for this company, after we sold it, um, I left when I was 29. Wow. So by the time I was 30, I was out. After so, working for the company and everything. So you're all set by 30. Like, what, I, had what enough, I had enough to retire, but then I built a mortgage business in the US and lost it all. No. <laughs> everything. In, in the 2008 crisis, I lost it all completely. What was it? What happened there? I built in 2004, I built a mortgage bank for undocumented Hispanics in the US. So I was the subprime of the subprime. There was no one more subprime than me. And we started growing really, really fast and hiring people and open offices and just scaling. And then the subprime one day shut down and we were shut down in an afternoon. So, oh, and then no one could pay their debts, and you were just sitting there holding the bag, and you're like, and I oh, had no. five houses in the portfolio that went to half the price. I had 120 employees, four offices, lease contracts. It was a mess. Oh my! What was your biggest learning from that? So, in the first one, I had no idea what I was doing, so I was really thirst for learning and following systems and being very disciplined. In the second one, I said, like, ah, I drank my own Kool-Aid. I thought I was cool and great. And I didn't follow any system. I, I thought I was cool and it was enough. Or I was great as CEO and that was enough. So my company was, um, I was very undisciplined entrepreneur. And we didn't have very good systems and processes. Uh, and when the company moved very, very fast, or the market moved very, very fast, I was not able to react fast. Yeah. Um, and I got with everything invested at the moment. Uh, with very little systems and processes, and that destroyed me. Really? Yeah. So I wow. lost all of it and had, and by the way, I went to my investors and said, guys, I lost everything. I cannot put a dime more. 
all the money that you put is gone. This is what we have. I recommend we shut it down. Everyone said, okay, we shut it down. They gave me all the approval. I said, but wait, wait, wait. There's a million dollars to close leases and shut down offices and lines of credit and everything. And they looked at each other and said, you're the operator. You pay for that. So I lost my, my money. I'm okay. But every dime of the operation is yours. So I remember I, I went to Dallas. Most of my investors were in Dallas. I was living in Austin. So I left the office, called my wife and said, hey, we decided to, to shut down the office. Uh, but I need to tell you several things. So wait for me. I wake. I'll, I'll be home in three hours. So I drove from Dallas back, came home a little bit late and said, so here's the story. They already, they everyone said, okay, I lost my money, shut down the office. There's a million dollars in debt of the operation that I'm going to have to carry that. I lost all my assets. My visa is attached to the company. So if we shut the company, we have no visa. So we have a couple of months to get out of the US. Oh my so God. Let's sell the house, get the kids out of school and everything. And of course, I was super depressed. So it was it was rough time. I, it took me probably six, eight months uh, of a very bad depression to get out. Really? I was, I was, I would just wake up at two o'clock in the morning, sweating cold, crying every night for a long time. Wow. I really appreciate you sharing that because people can look at it through one lens and see incredible, amazing. And then you can look at another lens and you're like, reality. <laughs> like sometimes get smacked in the face. I'll give you one reality. You see, I have a white eyebrow. Yeah. I have vitiligo. It's what they call tonical. It's an autoimmune disease that loses the pigment on the skin. This was not then, was an, another issue with another company later. So one day I go to bed at 10 p.m. with my wife, we have a good night, whatever. We give a kiss, we sleep. And the next morning I wake up and my wife is like, What happened? And I was like, What do you mean? Your eyebrow is white. Out of the blue, overnight. I woke wow. up with eyebrow white. And went to a doctor, and doctor says you have vitiligo, and 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 you have no color, no toning in that part of the, the skin, so you're gonna turn all white. And you know the people that have vitiligo that they have like like uh, yes, um, uh, what's his name, um, Michael Jackson. That's why he turned white. He was having vitiligo. That's why he stopped going out and wearing hat and everything. He he didn't want people to see him. Um, and I was very nervous at that moment, and it started growing. And one day, my wife said, "Why are you worried? It's like, you never worried about worry about how you look. Why are you worried?" And I start stop worrying, and then it stopped. And I've had it like that all my life, or many years. I've been like this for like ten years. I think that's a very important to lesson because there's so many times in our life where we fo- where energy goes. I forget what the line is. It's by Tony Robbins. It's where energy goes uh, or where focus goes, energy grows. And it's kind of like this idea of like, if you really want to build a business, focus on the business. If you want, if people like, and there's a lot of people who sit there and go, I got sick. Why'd you get sick? It's because you told yourself I'm sick every single day. (laughs) Yeah. You got to be focusing on the right thing. Yeah. And I was worried and it was growing. And when I stopped worrying, it stopped growing. That's that's incredible. And every that's day incredible. when I wake up and see me on the, I rem, it reminds me of that. So today I do way more exercise. I am less stressful. I don't take things personal because yeah. I know that it's not going to change anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a really important thing too, is that regardless of who it is, people would judge you. If they're really judging you, they should judge you on your character and how you act with them, not how you look or anything of that sort. And I've been in such bad situations in the past that it's hard to get into anything as bad as that. Yeah. And the no, challenges I, today, yes, there are challenges, but nothing as big as I've been in the past. Well, that's why I think it's so important that we do these kind of podcasts and these long forms because it shows someone like yourself who someone would see as very accomplished, successful, that there are real ups and downs in life and you need to have proper perspective to know, hey, is this a big deal? Am I going to care about this in five years? No, yes, maybe. They're then really I should entrepreneurs. Care. They've all had big failures. I have a yeah. podcast in Spanish. Uh, I, I do the podcast for EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, in Spanish. I'm the host. And my first question is, tell me a failure that defines you. Like, there's no good entrepreneur that they haven't had a big failure that defined them. 
Yeah. But I am who I am because of the two or three big, big failures I've had. Absolutely. And by the way, am I way more covered today? I have savings. I have money in the bank, systems, processes, contracts, like everything is tight to make sure I don't get into trouble again. Well, it's super important. And I don't think a lot of people realize it, but like just being a little bit financially just leaving a year or two or leaving money on the sidelines and not going because there's this culture of we need to go all in on our on our passion and it's like you can do whatever you want but like no one's gonna no one's gonna help you out here like but when i so i was an entrepreneur uh i did the mortgage bank went under became a ceo coach and i was coaching companies all over the world how to scale and then when i restart the growth institute and and uh next scale up I told my wife, hey, I'm going to do all this company. And she was like, whoa, 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 wait. Before you do it, I want six months of cash in the bank. Is it because I've seen you being an entrepreneur and I know you're going to have these ups and downs. And if you get into financial trouble with the company, the family gets in financial trouble. He said, no way. I want an account with my name with at least six months. So whenever you're stressed and you could not get a payroll or whatever in your company, the house is going to be fine. Yeah. But that was part of the rule with my wife. I, the one thing I really, I'm enjoying all this, but one of the major things I'm enjoying is that you actually have very stringent rules that you guys follow with the multiple passports, the six months, because if your wife's not for it, then you might not be for it because you guys got to be in it for a team. Oh, yeah. I, I and indeed, <laughs> it's interesting. I did a, I, I run a program in MIT this April called Gathering of Titans. Um, and the theme of this year was halftime. And I believe I'm in my second half. I'm really signing my second half of my life. My first half was all about making money and all about me being great. My second half is all about impact. My kids are going to college. It's a very different. And one of the things that I realize is the first time I, I like to put long-term objectives. I built one when I was in my 30s. I built a 25-year plan until I was 55. And one of the faculty said, yeah, I did my own, my own. I didn't share it with my wife. And I was like, oh my God, I did it on my own. And so I, I did the design and then I went to my wife and said, hey, look what I'm going to do. This time I'm redoing it with her. Uh, but at that moment, it was like, here's my plan to make money and the company and all that. I'm just letting you know what I'm going to do, right? Completely different perspective this time. Now my well, second half is going to be way more with my wife. Um, my first half was all about travel and making businesses and making money and all that. Now it's all about spending time with her and the kids. So it's a completely different plan. Now we're really signing it together, her and I. And how much money you want to have, how much you want to have passive income or investment income, uh, where do you want to live, kids, all that. And it's all designed with her. Wow. And how important do you think is design of our life? Because it's really important. So, so I think there's two types of people. People that they choose what they want or people that don't choose and they just go like ping pong in life and life tells you where you want to go, where they want you to go. But if you choose, you could decide where to go. If you don't choose and you just go through life, life's going to give you what they want. And sometimes it's going to be great. Sometimes it's going to be bad and you have to accept. So it's like Alice in Wonderland. She goes walking and sees the rabbit and said, Hey rabbit, I'm going to the right direction. And the rabbit said, where do you want to go? And she's like, I have no idea. I said, just continue walking. You're going to get there. And that's how people go in life. You just walk through life. And whatever I, life gives you, they take it. Yeah. Yeah, 100. I you, but I love to take decisions. I hate when life pushes. Me. Yeah, 100%. Because, I mean, the thing is, we'll, we'll sit there in any moment of any time. And I see this a lot with, uh, with just different clients, different people I work with. And we sit there and you're like, okay, so what's your current situation? And you sit there and you're like, okay, I have this good job. I'm doing this, blah, 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 this relationship. And then you sit there and you go, okay, like, how did this happen? How long is this happening for? Are you going to planning on staying here? Is this something you want to lead? Like, like, what's the strategy here? Not that it's like you're in a good place or a bad place or a comfortable place, but it's what do you really want to do? And how did, how is this activity pushing towards that? Or if it's not, Change the activity. I tell people that most entrepreneurs, we never think we're going to be a CEO of a company. 
Like you have a, you see a problem or you want to make money, you start doing something and serving clients and hiring people. And then one day you wake up and say like, why? I'm the CEO. I have like 20 people working for me. Like it, it's this shock. And I, I've had this conversation with a lot of CEOs that they, they don't, not depressed, but they, it really creates a big impression of them and they get really worried. They said, well, there's 20 or 50 families or a hundred families that depend on me. Like if I make a mistake or if I take the wrong decision or strategically, all those people get affected. So I have a client in Mexico that has like 10,000 employees. And I remember the story. He, one day they called him and said, hey, we're building the, or planning the, the Christmas party. Can we get people to invite their partners? And he said, no, just the members. We don't have money. We're too big, blah, blah. And I had like 5,000 employees. And he gets into a room for the event and they ask him to come in and give a kind of a welcoming message and sees 5,000 people in the room. Like you can't imagine how difficult it is to sit down 5,000 people for dinner. And the guy comes in and sees so much people and he thinks that they invite spouses with every team member. So he, he gives a speech all about, we have to save, we, we cannot have all these things, that, that, because he's really mad that we have all these people. He comes out of the stage and tells his head of operations, I told you not to bring spouses. And the guy's like, they're all employees. And the guy, he had a huge impression that night because he said, if I make a mistake, all of these guys with all their kids and their families, they eat because of my decisions. And he said, I couldn't, I couldn't rest that dinner. I was depressed. I came back. I couldn't sleep because you've never seen everyone together in the room and you realize where you are. So most entrepreneurs, we we don't realize we've become CEOs and we are focused on building a business and doing things. And then one day you realize you're a CEO and you have all these responsibilities and things that you have to do. So it's 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 a tough moment uh, that everyone goes through. That's really fascinating. The perspective of you don't even realize it's occurring. So so Daniel, let's go into it a little bit further. So. What are some of the attributes you think for someone to even get to a CEO to where, like, like what, at what point is big, is big enough where you're hiring people or is it contractors or is it like, what's the approach on that? What do you recommend to people? So I talk about stages and I have a, a video out there that companies grow in stages like human beings, you're a kid, a baby, adolescent and the rest, right? And each stage requires different learning uh, and different education and food and stuff like that. Companies are the same. But companies, you have a couple of really, really, really important decisions. What I call stage two, up to 20 employees, you could choose on staying there and don't grow up. Okay. And keep a lifestyle business. And I recommend most people should stay in a lifestyle business. A very few people should go to a scale-up. And for me, stage yeah. three or four is really a scale-up. And very few people have the capabilities to do it. And uh, very few people are willing to go through the stress and drama to really build a scale up <laughs> and really build a team. So I, I disencourage a lot of people to scale um, uh, because they should stay in a lifestyle business and they will enjoy it the most. And by the way, when I was starting to give this talk, this presentation, I was kind of explaining scaling up CEOs on how to really build a scale up. And the one thing that I was surprised, most people that, came with me after and said, hey, your talk had a big impact, is you gave me the liberty to stay on stage two and don't grow. Everyone's like, wow, you have 15, 20 employees. When are you going to get to 100? And everyone's pushing you to scale your company. I don't want to scale my company. I, I want to have a, a lifestyle business and have a better life. Indeed, I have, they have three companies. I have two scale-ups and one, let's say, lifestyle business or stage two. Which one do you think that my wife likes the best, the most? That lifestyle. Lifestyle. My wife loves it because it puts very little attention on me. It has very little risk. Uh, if things go bad and there is a recession, whatever, I have no risk on that company. And that's the one that produces the most cash in the most stable manner. My wife loves it. She doesn't like the scale-ups that much because she knows that I'm doing them for me just for my my dream, my development, I don't need them for the money. It's just about the development. I, I want to challenge myself, but that creates a lot of drama. Uh, um, so I tell people and I show them, said, hey, if you're here, 
you could make this amount of money and have this liberty, take two months vacation, and really have a lot of fun. If you're going to go and do a scale-up, let's decide why you're going to do a scale-up. And I want you to have it very, very clear. And for me, a scale-up has what I call the value of death, between 20 to around 80 to 100 employees. And that's the value of death. If you cross the 20, you have to get to 100. You cannot stay in the middle. I say people, oh, I'm going to keep 50. No, you can't. At 50, you don't have enough business to really build a world-class management team for the management team to really lead their departments. You don't have enough people and enough revenue. So you have to go to 100 to really have the capabilities to build a team and the infrastructure to build a team. So if you're between 20 and 80 or 100, you stay in the middle of the valley of death, your margins are much, much smaller. You have a lot of drama in the process. So I just encourage other people saying, if you're not going to get to 100, stay at 20 or less. And let's just have your company very, very efficient. That will give you the amount of cash that you want and less drama. And you could balance that out. If you're going to do a scale-up, you have to get it to above at least 100. And then the next decision is selling it or not selling it. Because when you get it to 80 or 100, you remove most of the risk of the company. Now it has an operating team that runs day-to-day without you. And now it's sellable. Now you build an asset that has an enterprise value that people want to buy you. And let me run some numbers quickly. If you're on 80 to 100 in the US, the average revenue of a service mid-size company is around $120,000 revenue per employee. Oh, wow. Whenever you're around 80 to 100, you're doing 10, 12 million. And that's when you get called by all private equity firms. All private equity firms, the firms they know once you cross the 10 million, you de-risk the company. So they call you and say like, wow, you already de-risked the company. You build a great asset. Sell me half of it. Take some money off the table. I could support for your growth. I'll give you all the capital that you want. And you've had so much drama in the process of getting there. And, and you, you were lacking so much capital on the rest that it's very easy to sell a, a piece of it. And yeah. your family gets very happy because now you buy a big house and spend summers in Europe and the rest. But it's really until you cross the 10 million in revenue, not before. So at this 20 people, at this lifestyle business, what do you think is what what do you think that revenue sits at? Up, up to 20, up to 20 people. Uh so imagine you're doing let's say 120, you could do a couple of million, uh two, three million in revenue, and probably keep half a million to a million in profit. Okay. And you could still take two months vacation. You don't need more than that. I've always yeah. said, and, and I've discussed this with many entrepreneurs, above 10 million is vanity. You could live like a king the rest of your life with $10 million in the bank. Uh, and I see a lot of entrepreneurs that have 50 and they're pushing hard and having heart attacks because they're pushing really hard. And I was like, you don't need it. Like, yeah. you will not be able to take a dime with you. When you die. And your life is not going to change much between 10 to 20 or 10 to 50 million. Like, yeah. Really, change life changes very, very little. You're probably going to fly private instead of commercial, but like you're still going to go to great hotels. You're going to take vacations wherever you want in the world. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so that's why I tell people, if you're going to take it there, it will take you five, 10 years of your life with a lot of drama. You're risking what you already have. And if you're going to do it, it's because you're going to build an asset that you're going to sell for $20 million for it to be worth it. Yeah. Because if you stay as a lifestyle business, you live very happy. So I had an example. He's one of the most successful clients I have uh, in lifestyle business. He has five or six full-time team members. Has like 10 partial for events and stuff like that. Has around 8 million revenue. And that's like 3 million. Wow. You don't need anything more than that. Like that's yeah. way more. Indeed, when he hired me, he said, I want to hire you. So you don't allow me to make any dumb mistake. <laughs> Whenever I want to change my company and scale it, you have to say no. And don't allow me, remind me not to do dumb things. And I've been coaching like for eight years, making sure he doesn't wow. do dumb things. But but that's so it's it's for me it's the perfect balance of quality of life, knowing everyone and be able to you jump in the circles. leader, and you still could make a million dollars a year, a million and a half, yeah. and be very happy. Yeah. So you, you don't need more than that. No one needs more than that. If you're gonna do a scale up. Is it because you want to do a scale? Yeah. Like because you want to build a really big company and a dream and whatever. Like right? you want to be in the 5,000 list. Um, indeed, there's three types of entrepreneurs. And, and 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's three types of entrepreneurs. What we call the mountain climber. And the mountain climber, they have to do a scale-up just because they want to prove themselves. It's not about the money. It's about yeah. proving that they can. And what they want is growth. I am a mountain climber, 100%. Like the day I was in Inc. 5000, I was like, call my team crying and thank you guys. Like you helped me accomplish a really big dream. Um, so that's what we call a mountain climber. The second one is the freedom fighter or whoever wants freedom. And that's a typical lifestyle business. Yeah. If I see a freedom fighter, I don't allow them to do a scale up. They yeah. will hate their life. They say, I want to build a business so I could have the freedom to work whenever I want in whatever I want and just have that freedom and be able to have the cash that they want to fuel the quality of life that they want. Yeah. And then you have the third one that it's the craftspeople. And the craftspeople are the ones that care about the product. Like they want to see the product and say, like, I build an amazing product. They want people to see and they're like, wow, your product is great. Usually you have one very, very strong. And then you have a second one, kind of. A third, never. So as an example, Steve Jobs, he was a cross people. He loved that the product was perfect, beautiful design. And he wanted to grow it. But it was more yeah. important than him that people admire his product than the skill. He said, if I build a great product, people will buy it. Right. But he was across people. And you get other people that are really great marketers. And it's all about growth and being in YouTube all the day. Yeah. That their friends are seeing them in YouTube. Right. That's a mountain climber. So it's really important to understand who are you as an entrepreneur, understand your priorities in life and what you want, and then build a business that will fuel that quality of life and who you are. The worst yeah. thing you could do is giving you a different business that you don't want and you will hate it. Um, as an example, the other day I gave a presentation and like 20 minutes later, I got a WhatsApp from an uh, entrepreneur in England. He said, Daniel, you just explained your last 10 years of my life in 20 minutes and you did <laughs> poison. He said, I got to 50 team members. I was doing like 20 million revenue, but I was losing two or 3 million because I was trying to grow so fast that I was making all these mistakes. And yeah. one day I said, I'm done. I'm going to implode my company. And he imploded his company, took it back to 17 employees. And he said, I still make 8 million with 17 employees and net two. I'm really happy, right? But he had to implode his business. I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs imploding their business. Hey, perfect story. Uh, uh, four hour work week. The Tim guy Barry. grew a scale up and he hated his scale up. He said, I'm going to take it back to a lifestyle business because I don't like my business. Well, that's why Tim Ferriss, that was also super interesting because I've never heard it explained like that. But Tim Ferriss, he's, a yeah, he, he's no, yeah, he's notorious for literally just having his podcast, doing like one or two employees, living his experimental life and just doing what he does. That's perfect. Daniel, you That's are perfect. fascinating. This has been amazing. Hope you like it. Where um, can people, where can people learn more about you, learn more about what you're up to? So, uh, I post a lot of content in LinkedIn, uh, Daniel Marcos. Uh, I'm at Capacity, so follow. Uh, um, you know, there's a Capacity in LinkedIn? 30,000 people. I was not aware of it. <laughs> I reached it a couple of years ago and I was not aware. So LinkedIn, I post a lot of things. Uh, Instagram, uh, danielmarcos.scale. Um, that's where I post the most, um, between Instagram and, and LinkedIn. And then awesome. Growth Institute, my company. That's where we do a lot of teaching uh, and not really how to scale the leader. And we work a lot with the leader, but we work more with your team. Yeah. You could not be a great leader if you have disaster of a team. So we have to be able to help you scale your team faster than the company and faster than not you, but as a team that you grow fast because we're the bottlenecks of the company. And we, we see a lot of self-made entrepreneurs and self-driven and lifelong learners, but not your team. So we focus on taking your team to the level of the CEO. Awesome. Daniel, you're incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reaching the end of the podcast. For that, we'll give you a complimentary coaching session in the link below with Edwards Consulting. Hope to see you there and have a great day and keep clocking in.